backwards. You want to get the ball. Oh, yes.
three bars. Hear these words from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable, favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For God will speak peace to the people, to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear God that God's glory may dwell in the land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before and will make a path for God's steps. Please rise and sing.
the hope candle, and the first thing that I thought of when I thought about hope last week was that it's the light we find in ourselves when all seems lost. So, being 34, I put that in Google, and I thought, okay, what's going to come up? And I found this really perfect Bible verse. It's Romans 24 to 25. For in hope we are saved. Now hope is that is seen, but now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we wait for it in patience. I'm so pleased to welcome you to worship on this second Sunday in the season of Advent. It's especially wonderful, and I would even say transporting, to have your voices on Cora among us. We welcome you. We're so thanks for your presence with us this morning. What a beautiful sound. Shall we welcome them? And also welcome to Bob Geary, the director, and to parents and friends of these delightful women who are in our midst. We also welcome you this morning. And if you are here for the first time among us, we're especially happy to welcome you in this beautiful season of Advent. I invite you to stop by the door as you're leaving this morning and let me know your name if you'd like to do that. Uh, also, if we could pick up the friendship pads, which are in each one of your pews, pass them down the row and back again. This is a wonderful way for you, if you are a guest among us this morning, to sign in and let us know how we might contact you later in the week. I want to take a moment and welcome all of you who are joining us this morning by webcast. It's so great to be on the journey with you by web. And also there are join concern cards in each one of your pews. If you have a joy or a concern that you would like to share with us this morning, please just pick one up and fill in what you're carrying in your heart and drop it in the offering plate as it goes on, uh, goes by you a little later in this morning's worship. I hope that you'll join us following worship this morning for a time of fellowship, refreshment, and conversation. It takes place in our small assembly, which is just out these doors here. While you're going out these doors, you might notice that our Winthrop youth are selling Christmas wreaths. And I invite you to stop by and pick one up and decorate your door or your window or whatever part of your house. Put it on your car, but buy an Advent wreath. It's great for our annual summer work camp. There will be one more transition conversation on Thursday, December 11 at uh, 7.30. This conversation is open to anyone in the congregation who would just like to talk in the midst of the many changes that we are going through. And um, you are invited to share your experiences, your impressions, and a prayer if you'd like to come. Also, there's a wonderful invitation out for middle-agers and their families. You're invited on December 13, this Saturday, to a Christmas cookie swap beginning at 1 o'clock in the home of Margie Groninger and Laura Rodriguez. Contact Rachel Bauman, one of our pastors, Margie or Laura, for more details. Also, FCCB always offers in these, uh, this season an opportunity for those among us who perhaps feel that this is a blue Christmas this year. And uh, we invite you to come to a worship <clears throat> on Wednesday, December 17 at 7 o'clock in the Loper Chapel. That's a little over a week from today if you would like to celebrate and to focus on your needs at Christmas in just a bit of a different way. So next week, next week after church, we are going to be hosting and we have organized a Ferguson Solidarity Walk and Vigil, which will begin here in our congregation just outside our doors and will go through, wind through the Berkeley streets for about a mile returning here uh, to be with each other in solidarity and in prayer. Sonny, I know that you're in the congregation this morning, Sonny Graves, and Sonny is the organizer of this event. The ministers are supporting him, and so far we have 40 people signed up to walk. We want to make that 100, and I know every one of you in the congregation this morning wants to walk. So simply gather with us after service next week, and uh, we will make a peaceful walk through Berkeley. 
I know that some of you have seen the news and have heard about some of the violence that did break out in our community last night. This will be a peaceful walk. The Berkeley cops know we're walking, and uh, we're walking for peace uh, with justice, and we invite all of us to come in that spirit and to pursue the walk in that way. We have prayers this morning, prayers of thanksgiving and joy. We're so happy that Liz McBride, after an absence because of surgery from the congregation, is with us this morning. Rather than asking her to stand, I'll just invite you to wave, Liz, and let you know we're so happy that you're here and feeling better. <laughs> Welcome home. Also, continue pra continued prayers for Liz Forsyth, our organist who is recovering, and for Roger Hogue and Ella Sponseller. And there is good news to be shared this morning. I want to invite Troy Gilbert, who is one of the co-chairs of our YAM search committee. You're probably wondering what YAM is. It's not a sweet potato. It is our young adult minister search. And Troy is co-chair along with Debbie Woods of the search committee. We have good news to share with you. Well, it is certainly a blessed morning, and I'm, I'm so excited that uh, we have identified a candidate for call for the young adult minister. Um, she is a young woman by the name of Kit Novotny that, that is interested in coming to us from the First Congregational Church in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, she is... She is a very young person, at least compared to me. But I find personally that she has a very old soul and she is drawn, has really captivated all of us with her sense of spirituality and meeting community needs. And we all cannot wait for you to meet her. She will be here the weekend of January 18. She will preach and we will have a congregational vote. And um, it really is wonderful news. We think she will add so much to our community. And we, the, the saddest thing for me, uh, getting close to possibly to the end of this search, is that I won't get to work with this wonderful committee anymore. And um, I would like everyone who's been on the YAM, we have a couple of folks here this morning who have been on the YAM search committee, if you could stand up. Okay. <laughs> so I want to... I want to thank Elizabeth Driver Buckholz, who's been on the committee. I want to thank Charla Sullivan, who's been on the committee, who is here. And I want to thank Michelle Seppi, who's been on the committee. And I want to thank Pat DeYoung, who's been on the committee. We've also been honored to have Alex Bonte, Tom, and Tom Chia with us also. I got everyone, yes. So look forward to January 18th. We can't wait for you to meet her, and I think it's a really great day for us. Troy. Uh, <clears throat> as I pray uh, a prayer of confession, would you listen also in a spirit of confession, maybe with a hint of desperation? <laughs> oh, promised one, we are a world in turmoil. Our peace depends on your coming. We are a nation divided by race and privilege. Our pardon depends on your coming. We are full of good intentions, but weak at keeping promises. Our strength depends on your coming. Word made flesh, come among us, come now. We depend on your pardon, your grace, your peace.
Please pray with me. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me of my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed to unrighteousness. Amen. assembly today at 10 o'clock making some Advent and Christmas crafts. Was anybody there? Were you making presents for people? Maybe? Well, I won't ask you who they were for because, you know, I don't want to ruin the surprise. But did anybody, did anybody make one of those little glass candle, those little glass candle things? Or the woolly sheep? Well, if you didn't make it at 10, you'll get to go, because that's what we're doing for Sunday School, is we're going to sing together Christmas carols and be in there in Advent Crafts. But I was thinking, one of the things that I think is so great about this is that we get to make presents with our own hands to give to people that we love, which is such a cool way of showing love. But you know, and at Christmas, we like to give presents, a lot of presents. But you know, one of the things is we don't actually have to give anything sometimes to show the way we love people. Sometimes the best present of all is not something that we give with our hands, but some way that we show love in different ways. Can you guys think of how you do that? How you show someone how much you love them or appreciate them? Yeah. I've heard of that before. Uh-huh. You can give them a hug. And give them a compliment. That's always nice. Or a kiss. That's a really good idea. What? You can make them laugh. That is such a great gift to give each other is to make our hearts happy and make them laugh. Yeah, Malia. You can keep your word. That's a really, really great way of showing someone how you love them. Yeah, Will. Well. You can think about it. There's so many ways of telling each other, showing each other that we love them, that don't, isn't bought from a store, isn't even necessarily something that we make, just how we are. And you know, one of the awesome, probably the best model we have for that is Jesus. Jesus is our model for how to love each other and show compassion and care. Hi, you guys. So let's say a prayer. Holy God, thank you for the season of Advent when we prepare in all kinds of exciting ways to show in tangible, concrete ways people how much we love them. Help us to do that in the ways that we are, in the ways that we show forgiveness and acceptance and love and happiness and make people laugh. Thank you for all these ways that we can embody your love in the world. Amen. So you all can go off and make crafts together, and I invite everyone to rise and share the peace and love with each other.
Listen to the word of the Lord from Mark 1, verses 1 through 8, the part of the Christmas story before the Christmas story. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord! Make his paths straight! John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say, prepare the way of the Lord. And after I say that, if you're comfortable, would you repeat? I will. Prepare the way of the Lord. Well, friends, it's here. It's really here. And by that, I don't mean Christmas or even Advent. I mean that amazing and remarkable season of Hollow Thanks Christ Year. Many years ago, it used to be that all those seasons, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, all of those seasons were distinct. They even had their own colors and their own purpose. We started out by getting dressed up at Halloween in costumes to collect some candy that would last until Thanksgiving. Those were the days. After that, we'd fill up on turkey and lots of gravy and mashed potatoes as we entered into those dark days of waiting and eager anticipation of what might be coming. And in those days, it felt like it was a long way off. We had plenty of time to save some money, to buy something special for somebody else, and we thought about it for a long time. We even wrote long lists of what we wanted for Christmas. And we had lots of time to practice for the town Messiah, which seemed to me every time my mother left on Wednesday night for a rehearsal like an eternity. I would watch very secretly as my parents' closet filled up with presents. And every time they left to go out for a party or something, that was my time to run into the closet and check out to see if there were any new purchases. And I began to dare to hope that that beautiful medium-sized red sweater was mine. It was the most wonderful time of the year, that long time of anticipation between Thanksgiving and the ecstasy of Christmas. And it seemed to me to last forever. Now something has happened to us in this culture. Not only has the busyness of our culture taken over, we've also been swept away, I believe, by the crush of demands on a society that seems happiest when it is celebrating something in the moment. We are unable to wait, unable to anticipate, to inhale the sweetness of the time. We want it all today, we want it all now, and the singular gratification of each ritual has turned into one giant party. In order, I believe, to get us to buy more, be more excited, and to keep pumping in to our sluggish economy so that we might produce and maybe make a little more money. But primarily and spiritually, as a culture, 
We are unable and unwilling to reflect, to wait, and to trust deeply in the unfolding of life. Into this craziness and into this crazy time walks John the Baptist. How fortunate, how blessed we are to have a character like John the Baptist in this strange, confusing time. We hear him screaming in the darkness, prepare the way. This season called Advent, the one we are holding this morning, hardly registers with most folks, but this season belongs to John. He embodies it. He is it. This time of waiting and hoping and holding the moment is distinct to our tradition, and it calls for us to pay very deep spiritual attention, to prepare a way for the intrusion of a new time to come in and bowl us over and get us ready for becoming new again. These are the days, these days, we get to spend thinking about what is coming, to anticipate what is coming, not what is already here or what we are pursuing from one moment to the next to the next, but what is coming, what will break forth in us. John, in all his weirdness, tells us, reminds us that a new way of being is coming. The gospel will surface in political acts, in destitute pain, in liberated speech, and in healing gestures. It's his time, but when we look around, we don't see him anywhere. Just look around. When you leave this morning, even in our sanctuary, look around. All we see are images of a baby and his mother and a manger. They're all over the place. We get babies and stars and mangers. And for those of us who are less in the story, we get red birds in white snow. We get a deer under a tree or a poinsettia with beautiful bows. But nowhere in all of our Advent anticipation and our Christmas literature do we get a picture of a wild man crying out in the desert, wearing old camel's hair that probably stinks, and an old leather belt, and he's filling up on jumping bugs and wild honey. You and I know that you will not send a Christmas card this year that says, repent, <laughs> the kingdom of God is at hand. So John is not what our culture desires. He holds up an impossible standard for us, and I think that's why we don't see him anywhere. He holds up the righteousness of God. No wonder he hasn't been turned into a Christmas card. This year, I am so grateful for him. I'm grateful that he calls me to get ready. He demands that I get ready. He calls me out of the strange dream of Christmas as entertainment and into this concrete and real moment of deep yearning. We feel it. We know it and of waiting, and of holding inside of us the vision of the hastening of justice. John, like no one else in scripture, is raw to life. He is all about fervent longing and seeing through the muddy darkness of this time, he dares to hope for a new world, and he dares to hope that that world will be born today. And he isn't cynical in any way. 
He's completely passionate about waiting for God, and it's in every breath he takes and every pronouncement he makes. We have come, I'm afraid, to expect so little from our world. There are so many ways in this culture that we are dumbed down and shuttled away from our vision and our beliefs and our hope for something new and real. John the Baptist dared to reach for the transcendent glory of a mighty God who comes with healing righteousness in his wings. To many of us, I believe, are self-righteous in these times, self-righteous. We are unable to be self-critical. We have become content, complacent, happy, comfortable with our own goals and our desires, unwilling to see beyond our own need for happiness, and unwilling to cry out for the pain and the suffering of a world that has lost its way. We have become a culture and perhaps a community too pleased with itself, and communities and cultures too pleased with themselves can never break away to prepare something new. Today, Give me John the Baptist. Help me see. Help me believe in my dire need for God. And fill me with a desire of a new way to live in this broken, lonely, violent world. Turn me around. Help me hope for change. The change I can make. I can make in order for justice, peace, and love to reign among us. Help me to wait. But in the midst of my waiting, give me holy impatience for the reign of a mighty God. Lead me to more light, more truth. The deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner and the grand jury's decisions call us as a community into a John the Baptist time. Today, we can cry out in the desert and in the streets and in our homes. Today is time for righteousness. Righteousness means simply that we want to seek to fulfill what is pleasing to God. Not what makes us comfortable or happy, but what is pleasing to God. John dares to simply remind us that this time that we are living in is not our time. This time is God's time. Our lives aren't to be lived simply to fulfill our own desires, but to fulfill the desire of every nation, the desire to pursue the reign of a God of justice and love. This past week, our staff prayed a prayer to gather a litany, and the litany was written for those who aren't ready yet. It felt to me when we prayed this prayer together It felt to me as if John was holding out his hand to me as we moved through the wilderness into the streets of our town and cities. This is the prayer. Let us not rush to healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a band-aid when the wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies that diminish the pain being felt in this moment, in this particular historical moment. 
Let's not speak about reconciliation or how we can repair the breach or restore the loss. Let us hold this moment. And let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son. Let us not value false peace over righteous injustice. In other words, prepare God's way. Be here in this moment, willing to prepare God's way. On that morning so long ago, when so many had it up the river to be cleansed, healed, baptized, baptized and rededicated to the reign of heaven come upon this earth. Let us in this morning and in this moment in the congregation as we come forward for communion in just a moment, feel as if we are walking forward. We are walking into that great river of cleansing, of healing, of the desire for peace and justice. And this morning, let us be cleansed. Let us be cleansed and healed by our desire, our pure desire for the righteousness of God as we rededicate ourselves, our lives, and the life of this community to the reign of heaven come among us on earth. Prepare the way. Walk into the river. Amen. Come, O long expected Jesus, born to set your people free. From our fears and sins release us, Christ in whom our rest shall be. Born your people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, born your gracious realm. Come thou long expected Jesus. <clears throat> we earlier heard the words from scripture, prepare the way of the Lord. We may ache for something that is not yet here to come, to be present, and yet I think we hear an invitation to participate in this coming. How might we prepare the way of the Lord? What might you do? What might you offer? What might you give? What might you become? As our ushers now come forward for the offering, I invite you to consider, how can I, with my personality, my possessions, my passions, how can I prepare the way of the Lord?
God use this offering to prepare the way for the coming of your peace, your justice, your care. May we not block your coming into our world with our fears, our selfishness, our carelessness, our indifference, but may we make straight the path of your kingdom, your way, your dream for the world. Amen. Please be seated. I do want to remind the congregation that we celebrate an open table, which is to say that this, is to, this table is open to all who want to participate in the gift and in the celebration of community and in the life's work of Jesus. So we welcome all of us to the table this morning. I want to pray a very traditional call to communion. It's a tradition that uh, has been with me for many years, and it seems right to invite you to this table this morning with these words. Brothers and sisters, I welcome you to this joyous feast of the people of God. Come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and gather around this table of our Lord. Come not because you must, but because you may. Come not to show that we are good, but that we stand always in need of God's amazing grace. Let us sit together this morning in humility and thanksgiving, rather than in pride and possessiveness. Let us confess that we are not righteous, but that we love the Lord our God with all our might, and we desire to remember Jesus Christ in the breaking of the bread. Come, because Christ invites us to this table to receive grace, peace, love, and hope, and to experience his presence as he is known to us in the breaking of bread. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Dear Jesus of Advent, you are sometimes a sacred mystery to us. You have brought good news for all the people, and we will not be afraid, for you are here. We are hungry for your love, which surpasses all our understanding. We are thirsty for your spirit that never runs dry. In this meal, nourish our souls, feed our minds, Quench our deepest longings and forgive our transgressions, that we may glorify you. Hear us as we pray these words that Jesus teaches us still. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we are reminded this morning that on the last night of Jesus' life, he gathered with his friends in a room in Jerusalem. And in the midst of the meal, he looked at them all and he said, I'm breaking this bread with you so that you might remember me in the midst of broken bread. He broke open his life for us. Let us break open our lives for others. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he filled it with the juice of the vine and he said something like, this is like my blood, my passion poured out for you, so that my passion might flow through your veins and pour out in your life for the world. Every time you come together and eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. This morning we'll invite you to come forward down the center aisles. There are communion stations in the front and in the back. 
Also, because of the extraordinary nature of this moment of Advent, we're inviting you also to participate in healing prayers with Ernest and Michelle, who will be in the rear of the sanctuary. We invite the deacons to come forward for all things are ready. If this morning you choose to remain in your seat, but you would like to participate in communion, simply raise your hand or tell a friend and we will come to you where you are. Ministering to you now in the name of Christ Jesus, we share with you bread and cup. Participate in this moment as if you were coming through the waters. Let us break bread and share in wine together.
unison prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you for uniting us in the blessing of Christ as this meal fills us with joy and hope. Grant that in the days ahead, our lips which have sung your praises may speak the truth. Our eyes which have seen your love may look with compassion on the needs of the world. Our, Our hands, hands which have held this loaf and cup may be active in your service. We pray with gratitude and thanksgiving. Amen. Christ, who is coming, bear you up into grace, magnificent grace, and always love and glory. Amen.